What's your absolute worst nightmare? What's the worst thing you could imagine happening to you? What would you do if you had to confront such a situation? What do you think the end result would be? How would you be affected for the rest of your life? These are the questions that today's story poses. The fantastic story from Dr. Creepens Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me, and I could share them all with you. So, my dear friends, it's Friday, we've made it to the weekend, I think you deserve to sit back and relax with your favourite drink, and listen. To tell you my story, I have to go back to an incident in my early childhood. There were only four of us then, father, mother, and my older brother. Our parents were well-to-do, I suppose, and the house really was too big for us. I had my own room, a rather sizable one, actually, but my favourite place in the whole world was the little coat closet by our entryway. It was a tiny space, but I played there so often. My mother moved out all of the shoes and boxes of things in order to give me room to play. I would just sit there in my own little world and play with my soldiers, my stuff bear would just let my imagine take me anywhere it would. That cupboard was my spaceship, my time machine, my blue police box, if you will, an interdenominational transportation to anywhere I could imagine myself. Until one day, when I was around six years old, mother and father left my brother in charge of me and went out. This was fairly common, but that night... My brother was particularly upset to stay home and babysit me. He wanted to go out instead, and he was cross with me as soon as they left. It was a bit strange that his mood didn't last very long, but at the time, I was just glad that he'd cheered up and suggested that we play a game. He told me to go to my closet and go back in time a good long ways and then come out to try and find him and he'd be wearing a special costume to show me how far I'd gone back. (laughs) It sounded like great fun. My brother hardly ever played along with any of my silly games, so I was absolutely ecstatic. I raced for my little cupboard, closed myself in, counting backwards from the highest number I could think of to give him time to find a really good costume and hiding spot. I hadn't been counting for too long, though, when something rammed solidly into the doorknob. I jumped, losing place in my counting, staring hard at the door. I didn't know what to think. Maybe my brother had decided to change games, or maybe he was still cross with me and wanted to scare me. He spoke against the crack in the door. I'm going out with my friends for a little while. You'll be fine in there, right? We'll play that game when I get back. What? No, I didn't like this plan at all but I was afraid to say so. I was afraid that my brother would call me a baby. After all, I did spend hours in my closet. I had my toys and snacks hidden away. I'd be fine. But when I heard him stepping away from the cupboard and looking towards the front door, well, I panicked. I leapt to my feet and jiggled the doorknob, but that loud noise had been my brother wedging something under the knob. I was trapped. I yelled at him to wait, begging him not to leave me locked in there, but he ignored me. As he left, abandoning me to my panic, one last thing happened. To this day, I don't know if he did it on purpose. If he thought it would be a laugh or a cruel brotherly prank, or if he simply hit the light switch by mistake. But either way... I was plunged into total darkness. I howled at him, but he continued to ignore me. I heard the door open, then close, and then the thick, dark silence transformed the little cupboard into a portal to the pit of my worst nightmares. I pounded against the door, hoping to get free, certain that the air had gone out with the light, that I was going to suffocate in there. My throat began to hurt from the screaming, but not yelling was worse. The 
because then there was only that horrible quiet, and in the quiet, creaks and groans that I was certain didn't belong. The silence was so thick. I was convinced that every creak, every groan, every settlement of the old house was some terrible person or monster come to tear me apart. The walls. Where were the walls? They were getting closer. I would be crushed. Breathe. I needed to breathe. I needed to get out. My brother did eventually come back but not before my parents did. By the time they came home, I was an absolute mess. I clung to my mother, sobbing in a raspy voice, while my father yelled at my brother, and my brother insisted that he hadn't been gone too long, and that he hadn't thought that the chair he'd shoved under the door handle would hold me in. My mother brought me away from the cupboard, and the magic was ruined. I never went back inside. From then on, small, closed-in places terrified me, even as an adult. I couldn't be reasoned with. No amount of reasoning or counselling would get through to me. It was as though I just knew that something had been waiting for me in the dark. It was still waiting for me. For we had unfinished business. Even though it wasn't the dark that I was afraid of at all. The only terror a large dark room held for me was the fear that I would reach out and feel that the walls had grown in towards me, trapping me in. Still, I managed around it. I lived a fairly normal life. Well, right up until the movie. It was a rather subpar little spectacle. I remember thinking that I would have been better off staying in for the evening, and I was very right on that count, though. I didn't know that yet. As I walked home, <laughs> oh, yes, one of the ways I've learned to get around my phobia is to avoid traveling by car. It's not just the tight, closed in space. I cannot abide the thought of riding in a car because I can picture it plunging into the ocean or some other body of water and trapping me inside. Oh, I know this only too well, and so I walk. That night, it might have been wiser to accept a ride. I was walking towards home when headlights appeared behind me. I was slightly irritated when the car slowed down, thinking that one of my pals was following me to insist again on taking me home. Oh, if only that had been the case. As I turned to address the driver, I realized that I didn't recognize him, and two of the other men in the car were already getting out. I barely had time to think before they'd grab me, and in my terrified state of mind, I was petrified with the fear that they would force me into the car. The fear settled in my gut and turned to ice, as I realized they were, instead, forcing me into the trunk of the car. My body sprang to life, flailing and fighting, begging them, oh, anything but that. In the end, it took all four of them to push me into the trunk and slam the lid shut. Oh, the ocean. They were going to drive the car into the ocean and leave me in it. I was going to drown. There was no way to fight free, no way to open the trunk from the inside. All I could do was kick the lid of the trunk as hard as I could and scream, trying to get attention. I don't know if it was my thrashing about or a sudden bump in the road. But my head struck the inside of the trunk, and I blacked out. When I came to, everything was still, and quiet, and pitch black. I could hear a muffled, metallic scraping sound that sounded far away. And then I remembered what had happened. Oh, had it been nothing more than a nightmare? No. The wound on my head attested to that. Was I? No. No, I wasn't in the trunk anymore. I was lying flat. I sucked in a relieved breath, noticing how well I could hear it. As I felt the padded surface beneath me, dread 
filled me once more. I didn't want to reach out, didn't want to confirm my very worst fears, but my arms thrashed forward without my permission, promptly coming into contact with the same material that lined the floor. I kicked my feet and contorted my arms above my head, sick at the shape of my enclosure. I didn't want to, but I couldn't help myself. I reached upwards. For the briefest second, my hands met no resistance, and then they came into contact with the same padded silk. I shoved as hard as I could, but it was no use. I was in a coffin, and I couldn't lift the lid. I bellowed and screamed, my voice already hoarse from earlier. The metallic scraping sound was getting further and further away, and I recognized it now as the sound of a shovel against dirt. They were burying me alive. I begged. I pleaded. I thrashed as if I could somehow break free, and then I realized that all I was doing was wasting the precious little air that I had left. Sobbing, I tried to hold my breath tried to calm myself down. I squinted my eyes up tightly, trying to pretend that I was just lying in bed. I was safe. There was plenty of room. It was just a hot night, and my imagination was running rampant again after a night terror. Yes, that was all. But it didn't work. I knew that reaching my hands out just a couple of inches on either side would bring them into contact with the walls of my prison. But I couldn't sit up, couldn't just get out of bed and walk away, because it was finally catching up to me. Death was coming for me. It only had to wait until the air was used up, and there was no crack in the door this time. No one coming to free me. I was utterly helpless, dying in what was, to me, the most fearsome way imaginable in a dark coffin, losing air, hot and sweaty, already buried under the earth. I don't think I was calm anymore. Rather, I was paralyzed with my predicament. I don't know how long I lay there, in the thinning air. The shoveling stopped, and I thought I could make out the sound of that cursed car as it started up. The men hooted, and it sounded like they were driving over and over and over my grave, and then... Silence. I had one small source of light, and I didn't want to use it. Didn't want to see inside of the coffin even the tiniest bit. But I lifted my hand and checked the time. It was three in the morning. The movie had gotten out at eleven and I had to wonder how long it had taken them to fill in the hole. I didn't have long, I knew that. Best to just do what I'd been doing, and pretend I was just going to sleep. The thought didn't keep me from kicking and thrashing again, though. I regretted ever waking up in the first place. Why couldn't they have just killed me first? It felt like days had passed. Certainly, I didn't have much time left. I checked my watch again, startled to see that over two hours had ticked by. How was I still alive? How was there still air? I gritted my teeth as I felt out along the sides of the coffin, more carefully this time. My hand closed over a thin plastic tube. Air! Air! My murderers had buried me alive with an air supply. Why? Fresh tears fell down the trails already on my cheeks. I was still trapped. It would still take days for me to die of thirst. And I would spend them here. I started to sob. I'd been inside of the coffin for over 24 hours. Possibly longer. 
It was impossible to say since I'd been unconscious when they dragged me from one nightmare to the next. They could not have conceived a more effective torture for me. The tiny amount of air that filtered in was just enough to keep me alive. Not enough to keep me in any degree of comfort. It was hot. So hot. And every time I tried to move, I wanted to sob by how trapped I was. Twice now I'd considered just pinching the tube shut and being done with the whole thing. But my fear wouldn't even allow me to do that. Two and a half days I spent under the ground, nearly suffocating, before the noise returned. I thought I was hallucinating at first, but no. The metallic scrape of the shovel on gravel was back. Someone, someone was digging me up. I began to weep silently. It was probably my captors, but I didn't care so long as I would be taken from this wretched box. And that is my story. As it happened, those were my captors digging me free. But before they got to my coffin, they were spotted and the police showed up. My brother's wretched friends had thought up a prank to pull to cure me of my fear. My brother wasn't involved. Well, he wasn't convicted at any rate. The four pranksters were sent to jail. <laughs> I hope the cell isn't too small. I wouldn't wish that on anyone. As for me, the doctors say that I'm nearly cured and that I've been making leaps and bounds, considering where I'm writing this from. But they don't realize what a matter of perspective it is. Don't tell them, but I'm more claustrophobic than ever before. I'm only calm here because, well, the padded room of solitary confinement is so much bigger than a coffin. So another fantastic story there from Dr. Creepensvold, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me, and I could share them all with you. What did you think of that one? Very interesting story, I thought. Comments below the video, please, and as ever, I'll do my best to reply to as many as I can. Now, get out of there. Go on, go and have some fun. It's the weekend. <laughs> and for those of you who are stuck at work and doing something boring, repetitive, I hope this helped a few minutes pass a bit more easily, at least. Well, you know what? I'll be back again with you on Monday, and I do so hope you'll join me again. Until then, sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>